Hey, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining this uh, linguistics webinar. Uh, my name is Joey Lovestrand. I'm a postdoctoral fellow at SOAS, University of London. And our speaker for today's webinar is Marta Suzui Billens. Marta is also a uh, SOAS, uh, well, soon to be graduate, recently had a successful VIVA or dissertation event defense for her uh, PhD at SOAS. Uh, she's also a lecturer at California State University in Fresno and is the host and producer of a podcast called Field Notes that many of you may have heard of. Today, she'll be sharing about work that's based on the extensive research she did for her PhD dissertation on the use of honorifics by heritage speakers of Southern Amami Ushima, a Ryukyu language spoken in Japan. Uh, so Marta will share for about 30 or 40 minutes, and then we'll have time uh, at the end for your questions and some more discussion. So Marty, thanks for joining us. We look forward to hearing what you have to share. Thank you, Joey. Uh, I really appreciate the invite to share some of my research uh, during this webinar and maybe get some, some feedback on it. Um, like you said, I just passed the Viva, so it is kind of final, but for the future for publications, I'm really looking forward to getting some feedback and some questions on it. Um, okay, so let me just tidy things up over here on my side of the Zoom. Um, so for this talk, I wanted to discuss uh, stylistic shrinkage and how speakers in Amami are continuing to use their language in the face of language shift and language endangerment. And this talk showcases some of the data and examples from the Amami corpus that I compiled during my PhD. Um, so, but first I wanted to give some language background. Um, okay, so Southern Amami Oshima uh, is a Ryukyuan language spoken on the Amami Islands in Seito Uchi town in Japan. And uh, putting aside the issues on counting speakers that we, we all know very well, and just to give you a sense of the vitality, in 2004, uh, it was estimated that, were, that there were approximately 1,800 speakers. Um, of course, most of these speakers are very elderly, and so there's far fewer today. And Amami was part of the Ryukyu Kingdom until 1609, uh, when the Satsuma do domain from Japan invaded. Um, and since then, the Amami Islands have administratively been part of Japan. And uh, since the invasion, initially there was minimal language shift until the Meiji era. During the early 1900s, Japan was defining its borders and introduced a what would become standardized Japanese, a standardized Japanese education system to the islands. And this led to um, more rapid language shift and language loss of Amami. Um, while speakers started to adopt Japanese and Amami became stigmatized. Um, and during this time, during the Meiji era, um, Amami was banned from the public sector. Students would be punished at their schools for using it, and civil servants could be dismissed for using local languages in the workplace. Um, so today, all speakers are productive bilinguals. Um, and if we use the UNESCO um, endangerment assessment tool, this language would be classified as definitely endangered with the documentation considered fragmentary. Existing work in Southern Amami Oshima is quite limited. Uh, most work looks at the Northern varieties of the language um, and tends to focus on the most fluent or the best speakers. And furthermore, studies on how Ryukyuan language communities, uh, like for example, Amami use their languages in their daily lives are very minimal. Um, with normally only the best or, or stereotypes being used as references for conclusions drawn to as examples. Um, okay, so here uh, is a map of the Ryukyuan archipelago uh, divided by language, just to give you an idea of how these languages are, um, are split up. So Japan would be up north, and then here's the Ryukyus. Uh, Amami is here. Uh, here we have the where kuni, Kunigami is spoken, um, Okinawan, Miyako, Yayama, and Yonaguni. And uh, here are the islands where I where I actually was. So this is Amami Oshima, 
Uh, I'm on the big island. You can kind of see Seitochi Town right there. So Seitochi Town is the southern bit of the big island and then also uh, Kakeroma, Uke and Yoro all make up Seitochi Town. So this was my field site. Okay, um, so I did two field trips uh, for my PhD. I did one three month trip from December, 2017 through uh, March, 2018. And then in the next year in April, 2019, I went back for four weeks. I did um, a homestay in Seitochi um, and I collected mostly audio and video recordings and the archiving is in process at ELAR. Uh, I think there's about 50 bundles currently archived, but of course it's an ongoing, never ending process. Um, and I worked with 60 speakers, male and female. The youngest speaker was 27 um, and the oldest speaker at the time was 104. I used the friend of a friend method to find participants to work with for this project. Um, and it was ethnography based with heavy collaboration uh, with the community. So community members also collected data. Um, and this actually turned into a much bigger aspect of the project than I had intended because when I arrived in December, 2017, um, it was actually influenza season. And so the retirement homes where a lot of the speakers live uh, were not allowing extra visitors. So, um, but this actually turned into a great opportunity because I was able to work with the staff at the retirement home who are um, younger semi-speakers, uh, train them in collecting data, and then they could record their daily interaction with the elderly, more fluent speakers. Um, yeah, okay. Um, okay, so, uh, and then of course, language documentation. Um, this is a language documentation project. Um, so the collection is based on uh, conversational unelicited data in context. Um, and most of the findings are based on this unelicited, unelicited data. Um, and I aim to uh, document not only the Lexio grammatical codes, but also um, the sociolinguistic context in which these codes are being used by the speakers. Okay, so um, I took an indexical approach, which allows us to appreciate the function of politeness markers or honorifics um, as indices of speakerhood, um, e.g. Aga 2007, Silverstein 1976. And by adopting this view of honorifics, um, by looking at them as didactic signs um, and interpreting them together with the co-occurring signs, um, we can interpret these honorifics in other ways rather than as automatically polite or automatically deferential. So for example, um, instead of just assuming every time someone drops an honorific, they're being polite, maybe they're trying to create distance with someone by using that honorific. Um, maybe they're trying to be, they're being sarcastic. Um, it doesn't automatically render the, the utterance polite. Um, so by taking this approach, uh, we can study politeness as a phenomenon realized through the use of not only isolated phrases and sentences, um, but with context. Okay, so I won't go too much into this. Um, I just wanna show a, a quick breakdown of what the honorifics actually look like. Um, so there's addressee honorifics, with, which typically take on this yaun suffix. Um, and then there's two types of referent honorifics, a subject, um, subject and non-subject. And the subject will usually have an umo affix. Um, and this is kind of interesting because you sometimes see it at the front, sometimes at the back. Um, it can be a prefix or a suffix. And then a uh, non-subject will have this um, yaro suffix. And we'll, we'll look at some examples in a minute. Okay, so how do Amami bilinguals perform politeness in view of limited forms due to language shift? Um, 
based on interviews, conversational data, and um, also some literature uh, from other view QN uh, situations, um, we see that speakers tend to favor Japanese um, to convey politeness. So when they're at the workplace or in kind of a high stakes situation, um, they tend to use Japanese over a mommy. Um, and I collected a lot of data for this from the retirement home where um, speak, semi speakers in their late 50s and 60s who are still working, still in the workforce, um, are interacting with elderly residents who are the first language um, fluent speakers. Um, so they'll tend to use Japanese to speak with the residents, the older speakers, um, but then they'll use Amami amongst themselves. Um, I did collect an instant where one staff member was trying to kind of um, coax a elderly resident to do something. It was actually to do with my consent form because um, she, she was just kind of like, didn't really think it was important. She's like, oh no, we don't need that. Like I, I said, it's okay to do recordings. And um, I had explained to the staff member, like I really do need a consent form from all the people I'm going to record. And so he's saying like, please just sign this, please just sign this for Martha. And uh, he's trying to appease to her. And when he did that, he, he used the um, Amami honorific Kachi Tabore to kind of try to get her to do it. Um, and I also collected some instances of a mommy between grandparents and grandchildren. Um, this wasn't super common. Um, and in most cases, the grandchildren were respected within the community as being um, kind of strong speakers or unusual for their age. Um, but in general, if people were, if younger people are speaking to older, their elders or their superiors or in the workplace, they, they would tend to favor Japanese over a mommy. Okay, so what we, what we find here is that there's a loss of honorific and humble speech. Um, so kind of the most honorific registers or the most polite registers are the, have the most attrition um, and people tend to use those the least. Polite speech, which is um, like middling politeness is somewhat more prevalent and known. Um, so why, why do we see this? Well, um, the, most of the speakers who are at this point semi-speakers in their 50s and 60s um, probably don't have access to the forms or the domains. They just don't know the, the registers, the honorific registers. Um, also conversations where you have to be polite or kind of high stakes. You don't wanna make a mistake and make someone angry. Um, another thing I heard a lot in my ethnographic interviews is that people don't have much confidence when using a mommy. They, they would say things like, oh, I, I don't like to use a mommy with elders because I, I am nervous that my mommy is not polite enough or I've been scolded for not using the correct form. Um, so, so Japanese is kind of the safe choice in that case. Um, yeah, let's see. Um, and, the, and then finally, lack of modernity. So um, since the Meiji era, 1900s, Amami, um, the Amami Islands have been undergoing language shift and Amami hasn't developed uh, into a modern language to discuss technology, politics, uh, education, these kinds of things. Um, and this has probably rendered it less effective in certain domains such as uh, the workplace or the news, for example. Oh, and I, I'd also like to mention um, there still are some speakers who are continuing to use these forms. The oldest speakers will occasionally still use the full register. Um, so really now is the best time to document, even though of course it, it's admittedly putting together a bit of a puzzle, but as, you know, as more time passes, that window is shrinking. 
Okay, so the main question I want to discuss um, is in an endangered language context, what role do Amami honorifics fulfill in light of Japanese replacing Amami in the public domains? So what I found actually is that these honorifics are very common in what I call lexical touchstones um, for formulaic expressions. Um, and I'd like to introduce you to a few of them. So uh, ugamin shoran is a phrase um, I collected often and I got a few varied responses on the meaning. Most of the time people said that it meant welcome. Uh, sometimes people would also say, um, oh, it's kind of like long time no see. Uh, umore is also welcome. Um, and this is something you see all over the island. You hear it all over the island. Even non-speakers will say it to each other. Um, you see it printed on t-shirts a lot and souvenir shops. Sumioran is uh, like sorry. Um, and it's uh, widely known. I collected it in elicitations and DCTs, but um, I didn't collect it so much in natural or in conversational data. Kiaro uh, is like, hello. Um, this is something that you say when you're visiting someone, when you're com coming into their house and you're standing in the little inside porch, the Genkan, you would say Kiaro to like, announce your presence. Uh, Mishore, this is like, um, kind of like bon appetit or like, let's eat. Um, and I think people use this the same way as Itadakimas in Japanese, where they'll just say it, uh, thank you for the meal before they start eating. Uh, and then the last one that I want to highlight here is a uh, kibani chore, which means um, please do your best. Uh, so if you're trying to encourage someone or someone's just kind of having a hard time, you can say this to just, uh, yeah, like keep your head up, please do your best. Um, okay, so here's um, an example from conversational data, um, and just to give some context about the situation, so uh, the speaker, uh, C.H.-san, is a female, age 87, addressing her male neighbor, um, who she's lived next to for many, many years, she knows him very well, and he is younger than her, so normally uh, the prescribed usage would say that she does not need to use an honorific to address him because she's the elder, he is the um, like inferior, like younger, younger person in the conversation. Um, but I did collect this instance of her using an honorific where she's asking him, um, can I use your bathroom? Um, and this tabore right here is the imperative honorific. Um, okay, so imperatives were actually collected frequently in unelicited data and were very well known by community members. There's three forms of honor of imperative. Uh, the first one is the plain form, so not honorific. Um, so here's an example, kachi kuriri, please write. Um, so this is what you, um, before when I was talking about the, the consent form, when this younger speaker was trying to appeal to the older speaker. He was using Japanese except for um, he asked her to write it, write her name in Amami and she said, he said kachi tabore. Um, so that's this most polite honorific down here. The middling politeness one is shore, mishorin shore, please eat. And then uh, umochi tabore, please come, come over here. This tabore is um, the most polite. Um, I'm still, I still don't have a, a strong sense about why the imperatives seem to be so resistant to loss. Um, if anyone has ideas about that, I'd love to hear them. Uh, when I asked speakers, um, they said that they were often yelled at by their grandparents, and now they reckon that these uh, Amami imperatives are just convenient for yelling at their kids. So I don't know if that's the full story, but um, if there's other instances where the honorific imperatives seem to be resistant to loss in endangered language situations, I'd love to hear about it. Um, okay, so here's some other examples. Um, we have the kachi kuriri again. Um, the other 
the more honorific form would be kachi tabore. Um, and then here's the nshore, middling politeness imperative. Shinshore, please do. Nshore, please say or speak. Nishore, nshore, please eat. Umochi, um, tabore. So now we're in the most honorific. Please come. Michi, uh, tabore, please look. Shi, tabore, please do. Um, and here's another example from conversational data. Um, so some context, um, YG san is, was actually the neighbor of the host family that I was living with. And um, the husband in my host family would often mow her lawn for her because she was very, very elderly. She lived alone, she was, uh, she's 98 years old. And this wasn't something that she normally had to ask him to do. It wasn't a special favor, he would just do it. Uh, but when I was there, it was a very busy time for this family's business. Um, and so she asked him, like, yo, hey, can you mow the lawn? Um, and when she did it, she was kind of like teasing him. Um, and what she said was, Kusa o kate tabure, please cut the grass. This bit is Japanese. Um, and uh, according to the prescribed usage, this is a bit strange because she again is like very senior to um, the uh, addressee who's only 45 um, and her close friend and neighbor, even if she is asking him to do something. So this is what you would expect to see, Kuso Kate Kuridi without the honor effect, um, but that's not what happened. Okay, um, here's a participant observation example from a family barbecue. Um, so Okano-san, the speaker here, um, he was feeding his one-year-old granddaughter at a family barbecue at his home. And as he's uh, spoon feeding her, he's saying mishore, 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 which is the imperative honorific, um, like trying to coax her to eat, like, come on, let's eat, let's eat. Um, and when I asked him about this, he was initially quite incredulous that he had even said that. He was like, I didn't say that. Um, and then when he thought about it for a while, um, he said that he used Mishore because um, he wants to be kind to his granddaughter. And uh, using the mommy phrase Mishore expresses this kindness that he, he wants to give to her. Um, and then I was like, oh, well, like, what would you say if you were speaking Japanese? And his response was that he would say tabanasai, uh, which is literally just eat, not a request at all, um, no honorific. Uh, but in Amami, it feels right to him to say mishore, um, and that's like what feels natural to him. So um, again, we have a, an honorific that goes against the prescribed rules of what you would expect um, because you don't really, you wouldn't expect to need to use honorifics with a baby. Um, okay, so here's um, some language landscape from a elementary school in EKG, which is a, um, a school on one of the Southern islands in Seitouchi. And it says, uh, so that's one of those lexical touchstones that we saw earlier. And then smaller and in parentheses in Japanese, it says, uh, welcome to, welcome, welcome to EKG. Uh, EKG is the name of the school. And you may remember from several slides ago that Amami was actually banned in schools. So this is kind of interesting and uh, may indicate a shift in language attitudes um, towards Amami language valorization. Um, Amami is home to several endangered and unique flora and fauna. And one of these is the Amami Kuro Osagi or uh, the Amami black rabbit. And so here we have this sign with a Amami, um, a mommy honorific shore. Um, and it says, uh, you could eat hash, hash kuri shore. Uh, please drive slowly because of a mommy rabbit. Um, everything else is in Japanese on this billboard. Okay, um, this one says, um, 
Mata Orin Shoreyo, uh, please come again. And this is from uh, Yoro Island. It's the, the ferry terminal on the island. Um, and again, we have this N Shore honorific. And here's an example that was not collected during my own field work. Someone just sent this to me the other day. Um, and it says, uh, let's do our best together to stop COVID-19 or protect against COVID-19. And here's the amami right here. Um, and it says Maji Kibaro. Uh, Kibaro is the same um, Kibari from Kibarin Shore, which is a lexical touchstone. Um, so this is actually, does not have an honorific, um, but I just thought it was so so interesting to see Amami uh, used for this. Okay, so um, here's a, a snippet from an ethnographic interview where I was talking to uh, H. S. Son, who was aged 45 in 2018, um, and she is considered. Um, quite a strong speaker for her age. Her father um, is a fluent speaker, very young fluent speaker uh, in his late 60s, late 60s, yeah. And then her grandmother, um, her father's parents were first language Amami speakers. And uh, so I was talking to her and I said, how do you feel about using Shimaguchi Amami with older people? Do you have confidence in using Shimaguchi with them? And her response was, uh, for me, using Shimaguchi with my parents or older people or superiors is a way to get close to them immediately. It's kind of an icebreaker. There is a big gap between myself and older people when talking to them. But once I've started speaking Shimaguchi, it is immediately taken away. If I speak Shimaguchi, older people may think we, sh we speak a common language. Yes, I have worries when speaking to older people because I'm not sure whether my Shimaguchi is polite enough to use with them or not. Therefore, I often use Japanese instead in order to not make any mistakes. Um, and this is just one interview. This, this was a pretty common sentiment that I heard within the community. Um, so I think that these Amami honorifics um, today are coding not so much politeness, but rather coding familiarity and localness. Um, but localness, particularly in the cases of language landscape where you see them on local businesses um, and that they've become part of a we code in Amami. Um, and in the absence of familiarity or outside the home or at work, um, Japanese is the default code for politeness as in the case of the retirement staff using Japanese to speak to residents when they're at work. But if you're um, trying to express familiarity or localness or intimacy um, as a community member, then you can use the Amami honorifics in the Amami lexical touchstones um, as part of your Amami We code. Um, and I just want to share um, this a Shima Uta or community song from Amami um, so that people can listen to what the language actually sounds like rather than this just being data on a screen. Um, these these uh, Shima Uta or island so songs um, are like a very traditional uh, intangible cultural heritage in the islands. And this one is sung by Mr. Yamamoto, um, who is 78 years old at the time. And Asabana Bushi, this song is uh, kind of special because the verses are often freestyled with only the chorus remaining the same. So in the song you'll hear the chorus is the same and everyone will kind of jump in, but the rest he's just going for it. <laughs> Oh, Oh, 
Okay, um, and lastly, I just wanted to uh, plug my podcast very quickly. Joey already mentioned it at the top, uh, but I also host and produce Field Notes, which is a podcast about linguistic field work. Um, and I just wanted to share that because I think that we can all learn from each other in this field. We're a small field um, and yeah, sharing, sharing knowledge, especially in these weird COVID times where we're not going to as many conferences and meeting in person um, is, has definitely been very helpful for me. Um, and if um, I'm in a season of insider researchers and I'm still looking for a few people to invite on the show. So if anyone knows anyone who uh, is a speaker of the language that they're working on, please let me know. Um, and you can find the pod on Twitter and Instagram at Ling Field Notes. Arias Amorota, use some references. That's great. Thank you, Martha. Definitely can recommend field notes to anyone out there who wants to you know, get more perspectives on uh, what other people are doing in linguistics research. Uh, we got time for questions or comments. So if you'd like to uh, ask a question or make a comment, you can either use the raise hand function in Zoom, or you can just make a note in the chat that you wanna ask a question, or you can type out your question and uh, I can read it for you if you'd rather do it that way. So let's start with uh, Hercules, you have your hand raised. Hello, hi. Uh, that, that's really nice. So uh, I wanted to know more about the podcast, like uh, the background, how you're producing it, and uh, is it uh, which are uh, which tools you are using? Yeah, so can you shed light on that? Yeah, um, I I can um, I pretty much just use Audacity to to do the podcast. Um, but yeah, if you if you want to chat more about that. Um, I'd definitely be down to speak to you one-on-one -on -one about it. If you're thinking about podcasting, um, please email me. Uh, thanks. Sarah, you have a question? Yeah, thanks. I'm ready. <laughs> Hi, Sarah. Um, so I just had a couple of things um, I wanted to ask you about your, your methodology. I, maybe we've talked about it before, but I can't remember. But the one thing, well, one of the things I wanted to ask about, um, I know that you had a consent form. And so I was just wondering how you went about um, constructing the consent form and maybe distributing it in the situation where you weren't always in control of who was recording who. Because I think yeah. I might uh, use something like that for myself. So I was interested. Yeah, I mean, you definitely, I think when you're doing a collaborative project, you have to relinquish some control, which um, was hard for me, because yeah. I, of course, want to make sure that everything was being done the way that I had been trained to do it. Sure. Um, but the, I, really, I just tried to stress to the people who were doing the recordings how important it was to have the consent form. The older participants um, didn't seem very bothered about it. And, um, and I know in other endangered language situations, um, it's, you know, there's issues of safety or um, people, you know, might have other issues where um, they don't want the data out there. It's a little bit more it's pretty relaxed in Amami. Um, people aren't so concerned about that. At least the people I worked with weren't too concerned about it. Um, but usually what I said is, this is something that SOAS needs. Like this is something that my university needs. And um, for them, that was a good enough reason. If I said, oh, I need it for my, for my school, for my degree, uh, then that was convincing for them to do it. Um, some of the speakers, they, they could all write their names, but some of them, um, you know, didn't have like a lot of mobility. Um, so I also had a line where it was like, um, they could give verbal consent. And then the person who witnessed the verbal consent would sign the consent form in a different, in a, like a different line, oh, that's a like a witness. Um, yeah. So I could, um, I have the consent form translated into English in my thesis and I can send it to you. Yeah. Um, but but yeah, that's that's kind of how I got around that. Like, like okay, well, if they just verbally consent, they can't be bothered to sign it. And somebody sees that, then I'll have the witness sign it. 
no, I think that's good. If I could just ask a follow up question. Sure. Um, did you have them um, sign the consent form like before each session or is it just overall? Like I did an overall. Yeah, I did an yeah. overall. It was kind of too much, I think, to ask them to sign it each time. Yeah. Um, so I had a time period um, where like for collecting recordings between the first day I arrived in the field and then the last day, um, please, please like consent. Um, and then I, of course, always let them know that you can change your mind at any time. You can always revoke consent. Um, but then because I had that time period, I had to do it again when I went back to the field. But I mean, I think that's good because people kind of forget what they've agreed to maybe. Oh, for so sure. It's good yeah. to do it every, every trip, even though it is kind of a hassle. Agreed. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Sarah. Any other questions or comments? Uh, Anthony. Hello. Hello. Um, Martha. Yeah, thank you for the thank you for the talk. Um, I just wonder where I could um, get access to the the, the actual thesis. Is it? Is yeah. It, yeah. Um, yeah. So I my minor corrections um, have just been approved by the examiner, and I know so as makes it available online, um, but I'd be happy to just email it to you. So if you want to just email me, I can I can send it to you. Um, but I know that so as makes all the, the theses open access. So it, at some point, I hope soon, it will also be available that way. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll look out for it in the SOAS website. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Arthur, are you willing to put your email in the chat just in case somebody Sure, yeah. Um, yeah, um, well, I, I can do that, yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, Martha will put her email down in the chat for anybody who does have follow-up questions. Uh, we have a, another hand raised from Shreya. Hi, uh, thank you Hi, so Shreya. much for being connecting. Hi, thank you for this interesting presentation. Um, I've also worked on a couple of languages of India, Himachal Pradesh, and I was also coming across these interesting honorific uh, markers and along with imperatives too. It's quite interesting to see the kind of, you know, affixes that they tend to use. Um, as part of the study, I did also look at gender, like, you know, these mm. social factors that sort of influence and play a very important role. So did you also see as part of your work? Was it something that you were interested in? If you could just tell us more about it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, I didn't mention this. Um, that's really interesting. I, I would love to talk more to you about your, your work as well. Um, yes, yeah. so something people often said to me is like, oh, women use more honorifics than men. I think this is like an attitude people have. Um, I've heard it in Japan also that women use Kago more than men do. I didn't see that in the Amami data. It was, um, okay. I didn't see any meaningful um, surge in the female speakers. Um, yeah, I, I think, I, I don't have enough data to say that gender isn't uh, an influence, but it's something I, I would like to collect more data on. My, my feeling is that there, there isn't any influence at this point, probably because now the, the language is so endangered and um, these honorifics aren't really used so much to convey co deference, but more as like, I think this insider we code. All right, great, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. We also have a question in the chat from Kamto. I'll just read that question out. Does your research teach you anything surprising or interesting about the history of the people? Oh, this is a very broad question. Uh, I think I need to take a minute to, to kind of think about it. Um, I mean, yeah. Um, well, field work, I think every day is a new surprise, right? Like every day you're learning things about the people you're working with, you're learning things about yourself. Um, yeah, so I, I, I think field work is the most interesting part of the work that we do. Um, about the, the history um, in particular, I didn't see this in, Imam, in Southern Amami, but um, 
Dr. Ninaga, Yuto Ninaga, who works in Northern Amami. Um, he said something about how um, different areas of Amami used to be um, like different classes. So like you had the landed gentry up here and then the commoners in the village down here um, and that they would have their own honorific registers um, and that today these, these registers or these honorifics are not so much about class but are more about region because of like how people were separated. Um, so I found that really interesting, but it's not something that I discovered. Um, and I would be interested to see if maybe in the future to look into that for Southern, Southern Amami. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't think I answered your question, so sorry. Is that from the recent uh, podcast you did? That you were referring oh, to? Uh, he works on another island, but I, I can recommend another, another that another episode. Yeah, yeah Michi Nori Shimoji. Yeah, thank you. That's also a good episode. So just to get a plug in the, the podcast. Yeah. Um, I, I had a question or I guess a comment or a thought about the semantics of uh, especially the use of these honorifics in imperative contexts. So I was trying to think, you know, what might kind of string all these contexts together uh, mm -hmm. in some kind of coherent underlying meaning. And I wonder if one element of that, I should paraphrase this with, I know nothing about politeness and honorifics in language. So maybe this is obvious or way off, but I wonder if there's an element of empathy that's being expressed in these where you're acknowledging that you're creating difficulties for the other person. And mm -hmm. part of using the honorific is just making explicit that I'm acknowledging that this is inconvenient for you, not necessarily that I'm honoring you or showing that you have higher status. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I did see that where, um, you know, in the case of the consent form, he's trying to like appease to her. Um, so in some cases, definitely, definitely yes, um, where you're like kind of asking a favor, which you would be more, you're more polite if you're going to ask a favor, right, um, in any language. Um, but yeah, I, I think that could be an element. Um, yeah, I, I think the familiarity thing is really key. Um, in the case of the consent form, um, when I asked about it, he was like, well, she's like, I know her very well. Her, her daughter is friends with my sister or something like that. Like it, it gets kind of complicated too, when you're in the small community and like everybody, like your customer is your neighbor, is your friend. So teasing apart these relationships gets a bit complex, which is why the context is so critical. Um, yeah, but yeah, yeah that, that's, that's, I think that's part of it. So then I guess you're, you're framing your request as sort of calling in this personal favor, a mm -hmm. very close kind of, kind of thing. Yeah, you kind of want to like build that rapport, like, yeah, we're the same. You yeah, know, we're mm -hmm. both, we're most Shimanshu, we're both a mommy people. Um, Shimanshu, actually, there's a convenience store in a mommy called Shimanshu Mark, like Shimanshu Market. Um, like island person market and Shimanshu is an amami word. So um, seeing it as part of businesses, I thought was very like cute, especially because, you know, before it was banned in kind of public spaces and now you're seeing it brought back and people want to use amami in their business or in their business signed, I think to indicate like we're local, we're not the family mart. Are there other questions or comments? Otherwise I could ask one more question. Uh, I just had like a little anecdote to share, but if you want to put your go comment ahead. first, if it's on the same. Okay, well, something I was just thinking about while you were giving your presentation, it's a completely different context, but I will still share it here. Um, sometimes uh, when I was with my, my host mom, who is obviously older older than me, uh, I was in, in college and I was in Japan, um, sometimes she would do similar things um, that like what you were describing for um, your one consultant when he was talking to his, his granddaughter, he was using uh, mm. like a casual, well, I'm assuming it's a casual form of an honorific. Yeah. Um, and uh, so sometimes she would kind of do that to me. Um, and she does have kind of her own, you know, idiolect, but like, for example, like if she wanted me to eat something, you know, and we're, and we're close and good friends and stuff. So she'd be, you know, like Mishigare or like something mm. or like, uh, like using, using a, like a casual form of an honorific. Um, yeah. And it just made me think about about that those times, well, that, that particular time, but but those times when you were when you were talking. Yeah. Um. I, could it be like a role play in that case? Like maybe she's <gasps> like she's like kind of role play. Like um, yeah. I see people in the U.S. Like English speakers kind of do this with their babies sometimes. Like right. you know, here, Madame, or the Little Prince. 
That's right, true. right. No, yeah, yeah, that could totally be one of those things where she's like, where she's like, you know, she's saying she got it because she made it for me, but we're not in the restaurant. But also it's kind of, yeah, I, I could feel that like a role mm-hmm. play aspect or like a, yeah, like she made it for me, but I'm not her customer. But you yeah, know, she made just kind of like it. joking around in a way. Yeah, yeah. But it also felt like nice and familiar too. Like it's a role play, but it's also like you're talking about familiarity. At least that was my yeah. feeling, which doesn't mean a whole lot, but that's yeah not... no totally yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks Sarah uh, if there's no other questions I can ask one final question well it doesn't have to be a final question but I'll, I'll go ahead and ask so I was wondering about your how you see the link between these honorifics and politeness and the language vitality or revitalization situation mm-hmm. do you see a scenario in which people are going to continue to adopt the more complex forms would uh, say, you know, having particular sessions to train people on using these forms again, help the revitalization, you know, because they would feel more comfortable using these with more people. Is there a connection there between vitality and specifically the use of these honorifics and other politeness forms? Yeah, um, I think I think it would be very, at this point, the attrition is so deep that I, I think it would be tough to, even to document the honorific registers was, um, pretty tricky for me. Um, so I don't know if there are if there are enough speakers who can still remember because now like the oldest speakers are um, they who speak Amami as their first language. They um, they were children when Amami started to shift. So they might have heard these honorific registers, but they never used them in the workplace or in like school or anything. So yeah, I'm, I'm not really sure. Of course, I don't want to be too pessimistic. I think what's more likely is that if we could um, get like more of an inclusive attitude about using a mommy, like you don't have to speak a mommy perfectly. It's okay to mix languages. It's okay to use, you know, code switching, code mixing Japanese and a mommy, um, which is kind of in a way what's happening because the lexical touchstones, um, non-speakers will use them, will insert them into their completely Japanese speech, and then they drop in uh, a mommy honorific that's um, you know well known within the community, um, and this is accepted by by community members. Um, but yeah, I, I'm not sure. I think probably it would be more likely to um, focus on the plain registers, like those are the ones that might have a better chance of being revitalized. And that's actually what people are teaching in, in language and Amami revitalization classes. They only teach the plain registers uh, probably because they're the most well-known and people still use them with their peers. Um, so like the grandmas and grandpas are still using these plain registers together. Um, yeah, I don't know. Of course, it's hard hard to predict, but it's an yeah. interesting study. It would be would be great to see them revived, but of course, languages may continue to be used in another in another form and just continue. Yeah, I, I think it's exciting that people have kind of like relexified them and are using them in a new way. Even though mm. the honorific register is doesn't really have a place because it's been completely replaced by Japanese. Um, unfortunately, like very sadly. Um, but I think it's exciting to see that people are still using the honorifics in, in a new way. Um, but yeah, it's, it's difficult because there's always like people who have this kind of purist attitude where we should only teach the best pure amami. Um, is that realistic? I don't know. Mm. Yeah. yeah, versus just adapting and appreciating what you have and, and using it as it works yeah. for you now, right? And valuing that, right? Because it is, I, I think it's very cool. Good. Well, I don't see any other final questions or comments. So I think we can end our session there. Thank you very much, Martha, for putting the presentation together for us and sharing about your research. And uh, we look forward to seeing the final uh, dissertation online soon. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. And I, I really mean it. Like if any, um, I think it was Anthony who, if you email me, I will just send it to you rather than you having to wait for it. Um, Cause who knows how long it will take. Right. Yeah, thanks for that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'll just... All right. Okay. No, thank you to everyone for joining us. And uh, thank you again to, uh, to Martha. Thanks, Joey.